Hello my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 character building guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're covering my pick for the best ranger build in Baldur's Gate 3. This is another update video to my previous video of the same name, because that was recorded more than five months ago, and the game has changed significantly in the interim. Not only has Honor Mode been released, changing a lot of the strategies that you need when building Baldur's Gate characters, but also a number of spell effects have been changed since then, and the entire mechanics of stealth archery have been reworked worked since I recorded that video, so we definitely wanted to update this video in order to have a ranger build that's suitable for the modern era of Baldur's Gate. Rangers are an incredibly resilient and powerful class. They are a class that just gets the job done, and I think it's really nice to be able to include one in just about any party, so let's start building a ranger. Before I begin, I do want to take a quick moment to say thank you so much to Zepfan for the $10 donation, and to Keith Bailey, Ian Stark, and Very Fallible for becoming channel members. Thank you so much, my friends. I really do appreciate the support. So what do rangers bring to a party? Well, the key word here, much like it was for my fighter guide, is consistency. Rangers are extremely reliable. They're the consummate survivalists, being nearly impossible to kill in most situations that come up in-game. In some ways, they're even tankier than barbarians, and in practice, they're significantly more survivable than barbarians, because your ranger is going to be operating at range, and be therefore hard to attack, and has very high armor class, meaning that enemies will not be able to actually hit them, because rangers are based on dexterity. Rangers therefore are incredibly difficult to stop from doing the thing that they are attempting to do. They have great saving throws, they have great resiliency to enemy attacks, and their ability to operate at range means that no matter where you position them on the field, they'll always have relevant actions to take. If you're brand new to the game, or trying to introduce someone who's new to the game, this build I think is maybe the number one build to play. It will always work, it demands extremely little of the party, and gives a lot back in return. Rangers need almost no specific items in order to function at maximum capacity, they will not conflict with the rest of your party, they won't eat your brain power when you're trying to decide on complicated spellcasting turns, the ranger will just get the job done, no questions asked. Rangers do excellent, consistent damage, and are very hard to kill, and those two things are really important for honor mode runs, because a character that can just always get the job done is very is critical when you can't reload a save. On lower difficulties, this also helps, especially if you're trying to do a co-op game with uh, relatively new players. Um, either you can let them play the ranger because they will be able to achieve what they want to every single turn without ha too much trouble, or you can play the ranger and get around the unreliability, potentially, of your teammates. If you play co-op with people who fireball themselves or get distracted and forget to join combat, playing a ranger is a great way to make sure that you always have options, even if things start to go wrong. I'm using Minsk as the example character here, because he's the ranger of the party, but if you're interested in a build guide that focuses more on his established character and background, definitely check out my lore-friendly guide to Minsk, which focuses more on him as a character given his established history in previous games. For this character, he makes an excellent choice, or a Starian, both in terms of flavor uh, because it fits reasonably well with what he's trying to do, but more importantly, Asarian's unique mechanics synergize extremely well with Ranger. And if you're building this as a custom character, what race and background you pick actually matters very little for Rangers. They're extremely independent of that requirement, but some that work particularly well include Wood Elf or Half Wood Elf, because five feet of extra bonus movement speed can help keep you out of enemy melee range, which is important to ranged characters. Gnome or Halfling, despite the move penalties are also excellent choices. Gnome gets advantage on all of their mental saving throws, which is one of the only things that can shut down a ranger is if they get hit by a mind control or debilitating fear effect, so getting advantage on those is extremely powerful, and Halfling's ability to reroll ones works extremely well with rangers' identity as the most reliable class in the party. A natural one is one of the only things that can really give your ranger trouble, and so have the ability to re-roll those is extremely useful for them. Halfling in particular makes an excellent choice if you're planning to solo with this character, and this character does make one of the best possible characters for solo play, because it's so reliable, and Halfling can prevent you from running into a string of bad luck and dying as a result. For our ability point and skill selection, it's 
Worth noting that rangers are inherently one of the best classes in the entire game when it comes to their attributes. Their rangers are what's called single attribute dependent, or SAD, which despite the acronym is actually a good thing. You'd much rather be single attribute dependent than multi attribute dependent. As I often say, it's bad to be mad, but it's rad to be sad. The reason for this is that rangers use dexterity as their primary attribute if they're ranged characters, and dexterity is the best attribute in the game. It gives you so much more than any of the other attributes that being able to focus on it and get your damage and hit chance out of it makes rangers uh, the character in the game alongside rogue that gets to focus on the best attribute in the game and can therefore ignore weaker attributes in favor of increasing your dexterity as much as possible. That's a huge advantage that rangers just inherently get by virtue of being archer-focused characters who get to use their dexterity to do everything. For that reason, there are two attribute spreads that make sense. The really greedy attribute spread and the slightly uh, easier to play attribute spread, depending on whether you prefer quality of life or raw power. For the greedy attribute spread, we are going to go with 8 strength, 17 dexterity, 16 constitution, and 15 wisdom. This is the highest three attribute points that we can get, uh, highest three single numbers that we can get, and then later on we'll use an ability score improvement to even out these two odd numbers. You normally want to avoid odd numbers, but you have to take them here in order to get the highest possible attributes. Another option is to take 16 dexterity, 14 wisdom, and 12 strength. This gives you a little more jump distance and carry weight, and will play out a little smoother in terms of quality of life, while sacrificing one point of wisdom in the later game, so you get slightly uh, very slightly lower combat stats in exchange for quality of life. For this build, I'm going to assume you're going for the greedy attributes spread because one of the advantages of Ranger is that they get to do this, but I wanted to show you both options because they're both totally reasonable. For our skill selection here, the important ones that you are going to want are stealth and perception. It can also be very helpful to take a background that gives you sleight of hand because then your Ranger can act as your lockpicking character without having to select um, the natural explorer choice that gives you sleight of hand. So that can be very useful as well if you want to pick a background that gives you sleight of hand proficiency. Since you're a dexterity based character, you'll be really good at picking locks. Other than stealth and perception, there aren't really important choices to make here, so you can pick the rest based on flavor, but both of those are very useful, and sleight of hand of course is very useful as well. Acrobatics is probably the next best pick just because it makes you more resilient to enemy shoves, and that can be helpful in some circumstances circumstances. Next, it's worth noting that while I am going to focus on a mono class ranger for this build, and one reason for that is that ranger is actually quite backloaded as a class, meaning it gets some of its most powerful features near the end of your class levels, and so benefits from staying mono classed. If you want to multi class as ranger, two common multi classes are rogue and bard, which are worth taking at level one instead of your ranger level because they give you better skill access early and don't cost you anything to do it in that order. But for this character build, we're going to be starting with Ranger. For our favored enemy selection, we're going to begin the game with Bounty Hunter. The reason for this is that Bounty Hunter gives you advantage, or it gives enemies disadvantage on Ensnaring Strike, which is actually a pretty good spell, but normally Rangers won't get to use it because the save DC isn't very high, um, thanks to your relatively low wisdom. But with Bounty Hunter, you can hit with Ensnaring Strike much more reliably. Other options here include Ranger Knight, because there are some heavy armors that you could pick up, but we'll pick up Ranger Knight uh, that you may wish to use. Normally you'll be in medium armor and that'll be better, but there are some pieces of heavy armor that are okay for you, uh, so Ranger Knight provides some advantages there, but we'll pick up Ranger Knight later on down the build anyways. For our natural explorer pick, if you weren't able to pick up a background that gives you sleight of hand and you want it, you can take Urban Tracker, but by default the best choice is to take Wasteland Wanderer Fire. This gives you resistance to fire damage and is part of the package that makes rangers actually incredibly difficult to kill. One thing to note with rangers is that they have the same hit point progression as fighters. They get the same number of hit points per level as fighters, and only one fewer per level than barbarians. But they get these elemental damage resistances combined with much higher armor class than fighters or barbarians will typically have, thanks to being dexterity based. So they're actually harder to kill than either of those classes, especially combined with their ranged positioning. So these uh, benefits will 
work very well. We take fire first just because it's the most common damage type that you'll face. Other than that, that's all the decisions that we have to make at level 1, so let's move on to level 2. At Ranger level 2, we get access to two new things, spells and a fighting style. Since this is an archery build, we're going to take archery fighting style. And archery fighting style is worth noting as one of the best reasons to play an archer. It's a huge advantage that archers get over melee characters. Plus two to hit is an incredibly powerful bonus and means that your attacks are much more reliable than melee characters at this stage of the game. And going on into the late game, you're just more likely to hit your shots, which matters a lot when you're trying to just do solid, consistent damage. Archery fighting style is great one of the draws to be an archer in the first place, and of course we're going to take it because we want to build an archer. For our spell selection here, we are going to take Hunter's Mark. Hunter's Mark is really important in the early game. It gives you a bonus action that makes your attacks do additional damage and is very useful for that reason. And then for our second spell, you are going to take Ensnaring Strike, just because you can use it with... Um, with the Bounty Hunter bonus to shut down melee enemies. It's pretty powerful. If you don't like the Ensnaring Strike pick or you didn't take Bounty Hunter, the other option here is to take a Long Strider. Long Strider is very good, especially if the rest of your party doesn't have access to it. It doesn't actually cost you a spell slot to cast and just gives your entire party plus 10 feet of movement speed for the entire day. That's a huge bonus for this character. So if the rest of your party doesn't have Long Strider, uh, somewhere in it, then you're going to take Long Strider over Ensnaring Strike. If it does, then you take these two spells instead. Other than that, we don't need to make any choices at level 2, so let's go to level 3. And at level 3, we get to choose our subclass. There are three Ranger subclasses available. Hunter, which focuses on an extremely high late game power spike. Um, at level 11, Hunter gets some pretty excellent abilities, but up until that point, it's relatively weak. It doesn't get that much compared to the other Ranger subclasses. Beastmaster Ranger, which I have a guide up for, but I think as a default choice for Ranger, Beastmaster Rangers play out pretty weirdly compared to other Rangers, so definitely check out my Beastmaster Ranger guide if you're interested in that. But I think that in order to build the most solid, simplest, and most effective Ranger, the clear choice is Gloomstalk. Gloomstalker Ranger gets five abilities right when you pick it at level one. Firstly, you get Disguise Self, which we can safely ignore. You're not going to be using this character for conversation most of the time, so Disguise Self won't come up that often. Although, it's worth noting that this can let you use the... Um, use any items that require you to be a specific race. If you disguise as that race, the game does count you as items that require that. Next, you get your two actions, Dread Ambusher Hide and Umbral Shroud. Dread Ambush or Hide lets you hide as a bonus action. It's the same as the Rogue skill that you get at level 2 Rogue. This is huge because other than Hunter's Mark, Rangers don't have a lot of uses for their bonus action. Hiding before firing means that you're making your attacks with advantage every turn of combat. So this is a massive benefit in terms of your ability to actually land your attacks. Combined with Archery Fighting Style, this means you basically never miss. Umbral Shroud to allow yourself to become invisible. You can use this just to get into position in uh, some combats if you want to make your way through to other areas of the combat to start in an advantageous position. This is pretty useful. Then you get Dread Ambusher, which looks like one ability, but is actually multiple abilities in one. You get a plus three bonus to initiative, and I cannot overstate how massive a benefit this is. Plus three to initiative doubles your initiative roll at this level. Initiative in Baldur's Gate is rolled on a d4, a four-sided die, meaning that a plus six bonus is more than any other character can get on the die that they roll. These bonuses were designed for... Uh, use the same numbers they were as tabletop D&D. They were designed with that system, where initiative is rolled on a 20-sided die. So the Dread Ambusher initiative bonus is worth five times as much as it would be in tabletop. And so this is effectively uh, Gloomstalker Ranger getting a plus 15 bonus to initiative at level three. That's a massive bonus and ensures that you'll always go first in combat. Combined with being a dexterity character in the end game, we'll have a plus eight, so we'll always go first. This is so good for many reasons. The first, of course, is that enemies who uh, 
you cannot, uh, enemies can't do anything if they're dead. So if you go before them, you can kill them, then they can't act. The second is, if you think about it, every combat that you win, you will take the last turn, because after that, enemies will be dead. So if you always take the first turn, the ratio of turns that you take to the number of turns that your enemy takes increases in your favor enormously. This represents hundreds of more turns compared to the number of turns your enemies will take, hundreds or even thousands more turns uh, over the course of a run if you always win initiative, which this character always does. Finally, you get dark vision, which is very useful in some uh, parts of the game, just a great passive benefit. Dread Ambusher also gives you 10 feet of additional movement speed uh, in the, in a, at the beginning of combat, which is great, it means you'll always hit your target, and you can make an attack that deals an additional 1d8 damage. This is a bad tooltip, it doesn't explain what this ability actually does, because what it doesn't say is that this is an additional attack that doesn't take an action. The first turn of combat as a Gloomstalker Ranger, you just get two attacks uh, when every other character in the game, or most other characters in the game, are only making one. That means that you can burst down almost any enemy in the game at this stage very reliably, because you'll never miss your attacks and you'll always go first, and you're making two attacks with bonus damage and uh, bonus chances to hit, martial weapons, so this ability in, in and of itself makes this character extremely powerful at this stage. For our spell selection here, if we don't still don't need to take Long Strider, you can pick up Enhanced Leap. It's similar to Long Strider in that it's a ritual spell, so it doesn't cost a spell slot. If you have both of these covered elsewhere in your party, then you can pick up Fog Cloud. Fog Cloud can be very useful to blind enemies because uh, if you place it on an en uh, if you place it on an enemy, they're blinded without a saving throw. Um, which is very powerful. If you can keep them trapped inside it, then they won't be able to fight back. You'll have advantage on your attacks against them. It's also a way to set up cover. It will blind you when you're inside it, but if you are heavily obscured, you'll always have somewhere to hide using your Gloomstalker bonus action. You can leave the fog cloud, shoot, walk back in, and bonus action hide, and enemies won't be able to target you because they won't be able to see you. So fog cloud plays out very well both on offense and defense for this character. In general, if you don't have these two ritual spells covered elsewhere, you're going to want to pick them up, so you'll probably end up with Long Strider, um, at least Long Strider you'll want to pick up, so you'll probably end up with Long Strider, Ensnaring Strike, and uh, Hunter's Mark at this stage of the game, but if you have those on other party members, then you can pick up Fog Cloud at this point. Level 3 is a great level for us. Let's go to level 4. At 4th level, we get to take our first feat, and the feat that we are going to take is going to be Sharpshooter. One reason that this character is so powerful is that we get to use Sharpshooter, um, which is one of the most inherently powerful feats in the game. It costs you a minus 5 penalty to your chance to hit, but you deal an additional 10 damage with every attack, which gets multiplied because we're making multiple attacks per round in the opening rounds of combats. We also get to shoot up. Ranged weapon attacks don't receive penalties from being on low ground, which is pretty important in this game because there will be a lot of enemies on high ground that you want to be able to shoot, so Sharpshooter gives you a benefit there. The minus 5 penalty to hit is mitigated on this character, by having archery fighting style, so that reduces the penalty to minus three, because we've got archery fighting style, and because we'll be making so many of our attacks with advantage. We can always hide before attacking, so the advantage on our attacks is very powerful. That means we are going to hit with this extra damage extremely reliably. Getting it this early means that we will one-shot most enemies in the game in the opening rounds of combat. Two sharpshooter attacks is enough to kill most enemies uh, around level four, so that gives us a lot of additional damage. The way to play with sharpshooter is that um, in general, you can just leave it on all the time. It will just do more average damage. The math works out where you're doing more average damage if you just leave it on all the time. But if you need to just deal some damage to an enemy, like let's say an enemy is low health, you can turn it off and then gain the, the hit chance. An enemy at 3 health, you don't need to do 30 damage to, so you can turn off Sharpshooter and just hit that enemy with a single attack to make sure that they die. 
as a rule of thumb, I would toggle off sharpshooter if your hit chance to hit is 30% or lower. If you are mousing over an enemy and you have a 30% or lower chance to hit, just turn off sharpshooter, both to prevent frustration, um, even though in some cases it will still be more average damage to leave it on, but also because average damage isn't the only, like average per round damage, isn't the only metric that you should judge things by. Actually hitting your attacks is important because the real metric that we have here is the fewest number of rounds taken to end combat. That's what we're really caring about. So as a general rule of thumb, turn off sharpshooter if your chance to hit is 30% or lower. Otherwise, leave it on and you'll do way more damage. We get sharpshooter this early because 10 damage is a huge proportion of most enemies' hit point pools at this stage. So while sometimes you'll see advice to wait to get sharpshooter until later in the game, I think that that advice is incorrect and you should get sharpshooter as early as possible because it's so powerful to pick it up early. At level 5, we get access to second level spells and extra attack um, and a bonus class feature. The bonus class feature in this case, uh, subclass feature in this case from Gloomstalker Ranger is we get Misty Step. Misty Step is awesome to have on a Ranger. It's a bonus action, which Rangers don't have a lot of uses for, uh, like we mentioned already, and lets you reposition. This means if your archer gets into melee and you want them out of melee, you can Misty Step away without provoking an attack of opportunity. Or if you need to be up on high ground or chase down a fleeing enemy or something like that, you have a great mobility option. Every character should try to get Misty Step. This character comes with it. Extra attack is just straight up doubling the amount of damage that we do every turn of combat. So obviously that's awesome. And it multiplies with our sharpshooter feat and any other bonuses that we have, of course. And for second level spells, we have a couple that are really excellent for rangers to pick up. The most important one at this level is going to be Spike Growth. Spike Growth is a huge AoE. Notice that it is a 20-foot radius, so that's massive. And this uh, spell just wins encounters on its own. It's difficult terrain, so enemies have half movement speed when walking on it, and they take damage, 2d4 of damage, every five feet they move. Enemies in Baldur's Gate are not smart enough to not just take a million damage walking on the spike growth, so there, a lot of melee enemies will just tank infinite damage walking on spike growth. Um, this can also be used to lock enemies into hazardous AoE effects, like if you have an ally uh, who is placing down a Hunger of Hadar or a Wall of Fire or something like that, spike growth can keep them in it. Importantly, spike growth is not flammable. Um, despite being plants, which is a little bit odd, but uh, enemies, but you can place it under a wall of fire and it will trap enemies inside the wall of fire just fine without catching fire and burning, so you will be able to keep enemies locked inside hazardous effects. This also just means that you can shut down any melee enemy that you are facing because they'll just be trapped moving at half speed, trying to come towards you while you're peppering them with arrows from range, so spike growth is awesome for a ranger. We could replace a spell with another level 2 spell, but we're pretty happy with our setup here. I think it is likely at this point that you're going to want to swap out Ensnaring Strike, though, because the en enemies will now have high enough saves that even the disadvantage from Bounty Hunter is unlikely to make them fail. And if you're concentrating on a spell, you will probably want to concentrate on either Spike Growth or... Um, Hunter's Mark at this stage of the game in order to maximize damage, so you can pick up Enhanced Leap for more ritual goodness, or other utility spells that you might use occasionally. Silence can be very useful. It is another concentration spell, but it's another no-saves effect that just stops enemy spellcasters from doing anything. Fog Cloud, like I talked about, is very good. Lesser Restoration has some uses as well, and is just nice to have available in a party. You'll probably have this on a different character, but it or on an item, but if you don't, then this could be a useful pick. And Pass Without Trace is ripe for later game abuse in terms of stealth archery, which I'll talk about when we get to that point. My general advice, though, is to take Enhanced Sleep. It's going to be the most generically useful uh, ability here, and so we can swap out Ensnaring Strike for that. 
At Ranger level 6, we get another favored enemy and natural explorer pick. Our favored enemy pick, we are going to take Ranger Knight here, because there are a couple pieces of heavy armor that we might consider equipping. Most of the time, including gloves, uh, boots, and helmets that are heavy armor, there is one heavy armor helmet in the game that's actually not bad for Rangers. It makes you immune to suffering critical hits. Again, one of the things that can stop a Ranger is getting unlucky, being immune to critical hits is one of the ways to not get unlucky, so Ranger Knight lets you do that. Um, and then the others are also just such minor benefits that Ranger Knight is the only one that really gives you any mechanical benefits. And then for Natural Explorer here, we're going to take Wasteland Wanderer for Cold. This is the second most common elemental damage type that we can gain resistance to, so this just makes us even harder to kill. At Ranger level 7, we get access to Iron Mind. This is incredible because it gives us proficiency in wisdom and intelligence saves. Intelligence saves doesn't matter that much, but proficiency in wisdom saves is huge. Um, the amount of debilitating wisdom save effects that exist in the game is very high. Wisdom is the most important saving throw to have as a result, and so Gaining proficiency in wisdom while already having proficiency in dexterity gives you two of the most important saving throws, proficient saving throw proficiencies, and means that you will almost never fail saving throws against enemy, um, enemy mind controls, fears, and so on. This makes your character incredibly safe to play. After a ranger is level seven, they are no longer. They don't really. Uh, care about melee enemies because you have very high armor class due to being dexterity, having medium armor and a shield, and so on, uh, and being able to shut down melee enemies with spike growth or just avoid them by staying at range. You don't really care about ranged enemies because they won't be able to hit you. Your armor class is too high. You don't really care about spellcasters because you take half damage from most of their common damage spells, and now they can't hit you with control spells either because of your very high saving throws. So at this point in the game, there's just nothing that threatens us anymore, and we can just stay in fights with pretty much impunity. Um, or if things start to go wrong, escape fights very easily by hiding and just running away. That means that rangers are an excellent safety valve for any party, no matter what the circumstances are, your ranger will live through it, which makes sense because they're an outdoorsy survivalist type. They should be good at surviving, and they are. For our spell selection here, we're going to take one of the other utility spells that we didn't pick up earlier. I recommend having silence available in every party, so we're going to grab that, but I've mentioned a bunch of other options that are all good as well, so consider what your party needs when you're selecting a spell here. At Ranger level 8, we get our second feat, and we are just going to take an ability score improvement and even out these odd numbers that have been bothering everyone all game. This gets us to 18 dexterity and 16 wisdom, so we have amazing wisdom saving throws. The proficiency isn't showing up here, but we'll have plus 9 to our wisdom saving throw at this stage, which is... Um, which is an enormous boost, means we'll almost never fail wisdom saving throws, and of course this increases our chance to hit and our damage with dexterity attacks, with dexterity based attacks, which is all of them. No other choices to make though, so let's go to level 9. And at level 9, we get third level spells. The third level spell that we get here from being a Gloomstalker is Fear, which is pretty useless for this character. We won't have the save DC to make this land reliably, so anything that makes an enemy make a saving throw we want to avoid. But there are some spells that are very good for this character. The big one here, just like spike growth before it, is plant growth. Plant growth is very similar to spike growth, but with a couple key differences. It doesn't do damage, but it quarters enemy movement speed. That completely shuts down melee enemies. Melee enemies will not be able to ever leave the plant growth, especially if you can combine it with a blinding effect so they can't jump out because uh, they won't be able to target outside of it. Quartering enemy movement speed will completely stop them from accomplishing anything, and then you'll be free to shoot them with arrows forever while they crawl through the plants. The other important difference for plant growth is that it is flammable, so you do have to be careful with where you place it. Don't accidentally put it down on top of a torch or open flame. Don't hit it with fire spells because it'll burn away and then enemies will be able to move. There are times when plant growth is better, times when spike growth is better, but they're both awesome. Neither uh, give enemies a saving throw, so it's really great to be able to have both of them and we pick up plant growth at this level. 
we could replace another lower level spell with another level 3 spell, but we're pretty happy with our spell selection at this level. All of our spells here have a purpose, and we're, we're just very happy to have every spell that we have at this stage, so we're going to stick with the spell selection that we've got. Ranger level 10, we get another favored enemy pick and another natural explorer pick. Um, our favored enemy pick doesn't matter at all at this point. These are just for flavor. So we're going to go ahead and take Mage Breaker to annoy people in the comments because I like to do that. And then we're going to take Natural Explorer and pick up Wasteland Wanderer for poison. So now we have resistance to all three of these elemental damage types. Um, resistance to poison is pretty good. You can stand in... You can stand in... Cloud kill and stuff like that, and that's very helpful. Uh, that's very powerful as well. We also get hide in plain sight, um, which is a reasonable bonus action or a reasonable action. You won't use this ability that often, but it is nice to be able to uh, become invisible as long as you stand still. Occasionally, you can set up ambushes this way, just an additional cast of your Gloomstalker ability mostly, but other than that, it's not going to do that much for you. At Ranger level 11, you get an incredibly powerful ability that makes your Ranger, who's already a watchword of reliability and consistency, even more so. With Stalker's Flurry, whenever you miss with a weapon attack, which will, should happen pretty rarely, because most of your attacks will be made with advantage and you'll have bonuses to hit and so on, uh, you can just make another weapon attack for free. This works with advantage to basically give you double advantage on all of your attacks. So you will almost never miss when you have Stalker's Flurry. Uh, the, the reliability of this character means that you will be landing every single attack that you make in almost every combat. It will be very rare for you to miss attacks, so you'll be outputting consistently excellent damage every combat, no matter the enemy, no matter the circumstance, no matter what they try to do to you because you're so resilient. All of these things together make this character just very hard to actually lose with. So if you're worried about a having a character that is resilient to play mistakes or a character that um, you can play while tired or whatever, this is one of the best possible characters to pick. For our spell selection at this level, you can pick up protection from energy just to be able to gain elemental resistance to even more things if there are resistances that you want. Honestly, at this point, it doesn't really matter what spell you pick, but you can choose a utility spell based on what your party might need. Protection from energy is a decent one just because there are some fights where cold, poison, and fire resistance won't be enough. Maybe you need lightning or thunder resistance, and you can pick that up here as well. Finally, at Ranger level 12, we get our last feat, and our feat is just going to be to maximize our dexterity, making our character better at initiative rolls, better at damage, better at armor class, and better at everything. Altogether, this character is just so powerful, so reliable. You have 112 hit points and resistance to most damage. You hit extremely reliably and extremely hard. You attack frequently. Um, Monoclass Ranger, I think, is overlooked in general as a powerful build, but honestly, a Monoclass Gloomstalker Ranger is excellent. You almost never miss, and you hit really hard. Great choice for any, any party. For items for this character... The important thing about rangers, honestly, is that they need very few items to compete. They will just never be taking important items from the rest of your party um, because they're so self-sufficient and so inherently powerful that they just don't need that many items in order to do well. However, of course, we can still power up the character by picking the right items. So let's take a look at what we need. The first thing that we need, and this is the one thing that is really important, is a really good bow. The best two-handed bow that you can grab is is going to be a significant boost to your damage, of course. I like, personally, the dead shot because it increases your chances to hit, and I just don't like missing with this character, um, or with any character, but having the ability to add your proficiency to your uh, ranged attacks is massive. It means that you go from almost never missing to just actually never missing when you make your attacks with this character. The highest damage setup is to use the Titan String Bow combined with an Elixir of Strength, because this lets you add your Strength modifier to your damage. So you can use the Titan String Bow combined with an Elixir of Hill Giant Strength, or have the Club of Hill Giant Strength, which you can equip in your main hand, and that will set your strength to 90. 
19. And then you just add damage to all of your attacks with the Titan String Bow. Personally, I prefer the reliability of the Deadshot, but the Titan String Bow is slightly more damage. It's worth noting for this character that when you have a melee weapon equipped and are using a ranged weapon, you still benefit from all of the passive benefits of the melee weapons. For example, you can have a, a shield equipped and gain the armor class of that, that that shield provides, even when you have your ranged weapon out. For this reason, this character is one of the highest armor class characters in the game, higher armor class than most um, melee characters, especially when you use one of the medium armors, the most heavy armor characters, especially when you use one of the medium armors that doesn't cap the benefits of your dexterity modifier. With the armor of agility and just a normal shield, you have 24 armor class, which is higher than most other characters can achieve, and that's before we've added anything else that increases our armor class. The passive benefits of weapons are also useful. Things like the Knife of the Undermountain King increase your uh, critical hit chance. You can just have this equipped and benefit from the... And the, your ranged attacks will benefit from the crit bonus. Or you can equip something like the Soulbreaker Greatsword, which gives you plus two to initiative that you just can, can just passively have all the time. Even a small initiative bonus means that enemies who could theoretically beat your very high initiative won't be able to on this character. I think the highest enemy initiative in the game is like a plus nine. So if you have the Soulbreaker Greatsword for a plus 10 bonus, then you're gonna beat uh, even the highest initiative enemies in the game with ease. Anything that increases your chance to hit is very good, and anything that increases your damage is very good. One trick that you can do is use the Drake Throat Glaive to enchant your weapon with an elemental damage boost, as well as give it an additional uh, weapon enhancement. If you do cold damage on the Drake Throat Glaive, then you can use the Snowburst Ring alongside that to make ice under your target with every shot, which is very helpful because then you can knock over enemies, they can they can fall over, or and an enemy who falls over on their turn loses their the whole rest of their turn, so this can cost enemies a lot of turns with the Snowburst Ring and the Drake Throat Glaive enchanting your bow to cold. You can also benefit from just anything that adds damage to your attacks, like the Flawed Helldusk Gloves, or the Gloves of Archery, which other characters can't use, so the Gloves of Archery just give you two more damage on every attack. Another bonus that I, or another item that I like a lot on this character that I don't see discussed very often is the Martial Exertion Gloves. I almost never see these talked about, but these just give you an extra attack. You take a bunch of damage when you activate them, so you have to use this carefully, but Rangers mostly don't care about taking damage because they're never under threat, so this can really help you increase your burst damage. Other than that, you are really just looking for things that increase your hit chance, things that increase your damage. Um, you don't really need armor class boosts or saving throw boosts, because you have plenty of that already, but if there's any that your party members aren't using, might as well stack those into, uh, you know, up to the moon. Um, but for the most part, the ranger is pretty happy just equipping whatever equipment is left over from your other party members, because the only thing they really need is a good bow. Finally, for multi-classing with this character, a lot of the most common multi-classes with ranger require a lot of levels of other classes, and are more uh, detailed than I want to get into in this video, but some common ones include four or eight levels of fighter for the goodies that fighter give you, um, or levels of rogue for assassin rogue combined with gloomstalker ranger combined with fighter levels of swords bard to make even more ranged attacks at range and i've done build full build guides for all of those multi-class builds if you search archer on my channel you'll find a million builds for those for ones that are more focused on ranger specifically there are three uh, levels, one level dips, and I think you do want to stick to a one level dip because the level 11 ranger features are so powerful. Um, but there's three one level dips that can really help uh, with a ranger if you're looking for some more utility or some more power on the character. A level of rogue just gets you really good skill access. You can get sleight of hand expertise, so this character can be your lockpicking character. You get some sneak attack, and that helps a lot as well. Uh, you can have them be the party face if you give them persuasion expertise, so that just gives you a whole lot of additional options for your character. Similarly, a level of bard gives you a bunch of bard utility spells, including a number that are great for uh, range, that are really excellent for rangers. Um, 
and gives you access to every skill in the game. So if you want this character to have dialogue skills, starting with a level of bard can really up the game in terms of dialogue skills especially. With the friend's cantrip and persuasion from your bard levels, uh, alongside a, uh, maybe a slightly higher charisma-based split, and remember that rangers only really need dexterity to function, so if you want more charisma on your ranger, you can definitely do that. A bard level can be really valuable. Finally, the most mechanically powerful one in terms of combat potential is to take a level of cleric and take war domain cleric. War domain cleric lets you make these war priest additional attacks. You get three charges of these per day and you get to make an extra attack, just a normal attack like any other attack as a bonus action. That can take your opening round of combat from two attacks in the early game with a gloomstalker to three attacks, four in the late game. And that gives you a massive damage boost in terms of how much damage that you are dealing. The burst damage from War Domain Cleric and the fact that Rangers mostly don't have a great use for their bonus action anyways means that War Domain Cleric can really add some additional damage. And of course, you get all of the awesome Cleric utility. You get Guidance, which makes you even better at passing the skill checks that you want to pass. And you get Blade Ward, which can give you resistance to physical damage to complement all your elemental damage resistances, making you even harder to kill if you really need to tank through certain... Um, things, and you get Bless, which you can just concentrate on from your spell selection. You get Bless, which you can just concentrate on uh, on yourself, making you more likely to hit your attacks. Sanctuary also gives you a great panic button. The other option here is to take a two or three levels of cleric of fighter, which can give you defense fighting style in addition to archery fighting style, so that, that's even more armor class. And then you get action surge, which increases your burst damage enormously. Um, this will cost you your late game ranger class features, so I recommend some of the more even class splits and definitely check out my guide the best archer in Baldur's Gate 3 for more on the fighter builds but two levels of fighter is so powerful for every or two or three levels of fighter for battle master fighter or champion fighter is so powerful for every martial character that it's definitely worth mentioning as a great multi-class option here those are the ones that I think are really important for rangers but rangers benefit a lot from being monoclassed as well um, so I think that sticking to a monoclass ranger is an excellent way to build this character. All right, my friends, I hope that you have enjoyed this guide to the ranger. It obviously was extremely detailed, so I hope you got a lot out of it. And if you have, of course, feel free to leave a comment and like the video. Uh, I read every comment that I get, and both of those things, all those interaction things, help me out a ton with the YouTube algorithm, which cares a lot about people taking the time to do that, so I really appreciate it when people do that. Um, and of course, you can subscribe to my channel for more of this and other strategy game content. And if you've really enjoyed the video, feel free to support me using the buttons uh, below to join or leave a super thanks. All right, my friends, thanks so much, and I'll catch you next time.